Just to kick things along a little bit before we go to the audience to ask some questions, I just wonder, um, Minister, <laughs> funding okay. models, federal-state relations, entrenched disadvantage, how do we break down the argy-bargy that is often perceived to exist in the political sphere. And importantly, one of the issues that I know many members at CEDA keep on asking is, how do we perhaps knock down some of the oppositionist mentality that comes from both sides of politics? Yeah. Someone puts up a good idea, the opposition, whoever it might be, simply knocks it down. In an area like entrenched disadvantage, trying to do better for fellow Australians, Minister, how are we going to do that? Uh, well, thank you, Speaker. Um, <laughs> uh, that's why, in my contribution earlier, I wanted to focus on the NDIS. Because uh, 10 years ago, if you had said there would be a national consensus to confront one of the biggest areas of entrenched disadvantage, people living with a disability, um, I think it would have been subject to precisely that process. But with serious political leadership based on very solid economic and social work behind it that pointed to its benefits and a sustained effort uh, to sell it, to make it um, as far as it is possible to make these things a non-partisan effort and perhaps most critically of all, backed up with a determination to fund it uh, through a increase in the Medicare levy as a dedicated uh, pool of resources for that, it doesn't fund at all, but it breaks the back of it, then I think that's a model about consensus building based on, surprise, surprise, hard evidence. Uh, and if that happens, then, and when the stars politically and community are aligned in the right way, I think we can see that change can happen and, you know, change can happen. The thing I didn't say in my address earlier was that there is now no waiting list for disability service provision in the Barwon trial area. People do not wait. Yes, there's issues with how the service is rolled out, but everywhere else in Victoria, there's uh, tens of thousands of people lined up in a very long queue for those kind of services. In the Barwon region, in the Wollongong region, in New South Wales, those things have disappeared. So change can happen, uh, it's hard fought, it's consensus building and it's evidence based. Thank you for mentioning Wollongong, most appreciated. Um, Alison McClellan, the issue that I have been talking about today and which we've tried to draw out from our report as well is that this question about entrenched disadvantage simply is not some bleeding heart, left wing sort of social policy, that in fact what we need to apply is uh, a combination of careful, thoughtful economic policy as part of that. You've had a very distinguished career in the Productivity Commission. There perhaps is a view that uh, Productivity Commission is only ever interested in efficiency, effectiveness and economic outcomes. How do you respond then to some of the things that we've been talking about in, in our report, and how would you respond generally to the, to the argument that you ha have to have that nexus between economy, economics, and, and good social policy outcome? Um, I think if you look at why there is entrenched disadvantage, you can see why it is because that nexus hasn't worked and how both have contributed. Many of the people that are experiencing that disadvantage well, are there because they can't get a full-time job. Um, some of them are there, have been there for a long time, and are, the, um, are suffering because of structural change in our economy, which is meaning that the types of jobs that they're trained for are no longer there. Are there some of them are also the aftermath of the recessions we had in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, and so if the economy doesn't work well and generate good jobs for people, that contributes to disadvantage. But on the other hand, if our institutions, if our social institutions don't work,
that also contributes. So if our education system doesn't work well, to give everyone a decent education, if our vet system doesn't work well so that you've got skills, then you get people that are, do not have um, the, the education skills to get the work that they need. And we know from your report that people with low skills and low education are disproportionately in there. We also know that one of the important things that to help someone be able to um, have the resilience to avoid um, being disadvantaged for long periods of time is based on their early childhood experiences. And this is where also the social comes in. It's how we support families to be able to provide those uh, experiences as well as having the institutional arrangements that support them and come in. Early childhood, good childcare, uh, schools and so on. So it's a combination of how our social institutions, how our economy come together to support families falling into disadvantage, particularly for long periods of time. But when they do, how we can have very cluey, effective services that are there ready to give them the very, very detailed assistance that they require. So we have to have all of that working together if we want to do seriously, seriously want to do something about disadvantage. Francisco, um, Alison just mentioned one dimension of that, and that is children in poverty and so on. And, and some of your, your work touches on that. I wonder, is there a magic solution in families that have been in poverty for a period of time that are seeking to claw their way out of that, but the impact continually throws them back and, the, and there is a, a devastating effect on children. One of the things that we highlight, I think, in our report is, in fact, there are generations of, of families where uh, poverty has just been part of the norm. What's your experience, uh, certainly from both your academic work and the Brotherhood of St Lawrence? Thanks, Stephen. I mean, there is no magic solution to poverty. I think that's the, the first message we need to take away from this report. And, and I think a key issue when talking about poverty is that there are different levels of poverty. Right? So you find people who are poor for a short period of time, but there are others who spend quite a lot of time in poverty. And this is one of the things we highlight in this, in this study. And when it comes to, to a highly disadvantaged, a, a key element or the key message I would take away from this, from this analysis is that people who are chronically poor are poor for two reasons. First, they are less likely to move out of poverty once they are poor. And, and this is important. They are also let, more likely to fall back into poverty once they've been in exile. And, and this has very important conclusions in the sense that if you want to help people to, to, to leave poverty, it's not enough with a one-off intervention. You need to follow people over time. Because we're talking about, as Alison said, we're talking about structural issues. So for some groups, it's, enough to, it's, it's, it's not enough to, to, to have one-off interventions. You need to a structural intervention that, pe that follows people over time. And in terms of children, I mean, it's, we, we, thought, I mean, we know now that poverty has very long-lasting consequences uh, for children. So, um, and, and it's, I mean, it's common sense, right? When uh, those who will be poor in 20 years' time are growing up today, right? So, um, yeah, there is, I mean, you know more than me for sure. There is a lot of research that shows that what happens to you later in life is highly influenced by childhood and what happens to you when you are a child. So I think it's, there is a double benefit of addressing poverty today. The first one is that you reduce the welfare costs of adult people and you also reduce the probability of poverty for, for children in the future. Thank you. I, I did neglect the mention, of course, that. Uh, uh, Francisco was a, a contributor to our report as well. Um, all that said then, here's the solution. Am I right? Uh, <laughs> and um, in our chapter that Anne has contributed to, early intervention, the key to preventing entrenched disadvantage. All right. You've got a couple of minutes to tell us how you're going to solve this problem. 
Look, there's no one size fits all, but the research is very clear. And let's take an economist and bring him into the room, and a Nobel economist, James Heckman. His research shows very, very clearly that the best way to get disadvantaged children setting on the right path is to support them for the long term. So have a balanced intervention, identify children in families early on who are likely to be at risk of poor outcomes, support them, as Alison said, in the early years, but continue to support them over the long term as they move through into primary school, high school, and into post-school education and training. That's the best return on investment. Return on investment how? Those children can and will complete Year 12. Some of them will go on to university, and as I think the minister alluded to earlier, we will actually reduce the corrections rate if we provide that important setup for young people. So I think education is very clearly the most cost-effective way of addressing this issue. Okay, education, great, mm -hmm. terrific. The whole panel. How we pay for all this? What's the simple solution to get a much more effective bang for our buck? <coughs> if you're a government that are confronted with uh, a budget crisis, although I think it's now been resolved over the last couple of weeks, if I understand some of the comments coming out of the government, but if there is an issue around budgets at the federal level, if there is a, an ever burgeoning call on the public purse to resolve some of this, does it come down to more effective use of those resources? What, what, what have you seen in, uh, from the NGOs and from, from deliverers of those services? Perhaps, Alison, please. Well, the thing I'd say um, about that is that we have to be um, a lot more knowledgeable about the effectiveness of our services. Um, we don't evaluate them enough. Um, uh, and I might add that when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about not about just about the non-government sector, I'm talking about state governments and federal governments. Uh, departments don't transparently make available the data about what's happening to their people, so we can't find out. And, you know, this is really important when we have um, services for this group that are supplied by the Commonwealth Government, by the state government and by non -governments, the non-government sector. And we do not do enough to get getting those people together, sharing the data, showing the evaluation, to really understand what works. And particularly for the very disadvantaged groups, when we really don't know what is the particular combination that will make a person with poor health or a person with um, low skills really, really get stuck. Uh, we really have to share our data and evaluate and be much better. And the, the PC has been very strong on that, particularly in calling for government departments to make their data more readily available. And if I have time later, Steve, I'll talk about a particular project we did at the PC by using government data to just destroy some myths about what happens to um, disadvantaged people. Let me continue with the data theme. It was very clear in the school funding reform that the, I think, $4.4 billion per annum which had been invested in educational programs for disadvantaged young people, whether it be Aboriginal or low, so low socioeconomic status, there wasn't the evidence to say whether or not it had worked or hadn't worked. $4.4 billion. So that in part, I think, Steve, answers your question. What the Smith family is doing, we are investing in our own longitudinal data set. We have 34,000 young people on an educational scholarship. They can begin in the first year of school. They're all highly disadvantaged. They can continue with us until tertiary. That is a unique data source that we are using to help not only inform our own programs, but also to make sure that it can inform public policy. We'd love other Commonwealth and state jurisdictions, as Alison has suggested, to come on board on that research evidence approach. That's the only way that we'll know that the dollars which are being invested are actually making a difference. Francisco, uh, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think it's something I when it comes to, 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 to children's, I mean, to, to poverty, I think one of the things we can learn from the literature is that it, you need to programs or services have to be targeted to those who are most disadvantaged, um, because yeah, it's probably where the returns the returns are highest. So, and the second thing, as as Alison said, is that we need proper evaluation, and we need external institutions that evaluate uh, programs. We cannot rely on internal evaluations as 
there are strong incentives to 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 not do it properly. Let, let's say this way. So, okay. Minister, please. I don't want to be the stick in the mud on this topic, but I think all the way back to the Henderson report originally in the 70s, we've got generations of beautifully admiring this problem. Uh, and I look around this room and I can see organisations that have delivered longitudinal quality work that points to the impact of uh, entrenched disadvantage. I can see Sacred Heart Mission, I can see the Smith family, St Vinnie's and other organisations that have done iterations of precisely that work. We've got Professor Fells over in the corner here and his own work last week finally released the points to this. I'm not against more data and more research and it has to be there and it has to be the foundation of proper contested, tested public policy and partnership. But I think we've admired the problem for a very long time uh, and surely we can start to move beyond that in terms of some of the programmatic changes that we all, I think from this report, can identify. Uh, so don't get me wrong, I'm all for lots of data and lots of reports. It's a very significant industry. Uh, uh, but if we want Nordic style delivery of quality services, then we're not going to deliver it on Banana Republic level funding. That takes me back. But um, well, I was going to say something look, I, I, ju I just wonder as well, as a specific yeah. example, I, I've been talking a little bit about this. People may have seen, and, and I'll be interested from a government's perspective as well as just uh, other folks' comments on this. Um, the last couple of weeks I've read uh, about uh, the Utah state in the United States approach to homelessness. And I thought it was quite fascinating. One, because it was in the United States and they don't necessarily have a great record in terms of social policy anywhere, but in Utah, uh, the government decided the way to tackle homelessness was to actually buy homes and put the homeless in it. And they thought that the economics associated with that far outweighed anything else. So there was a social dimension to it, certainly, but there was an economic dimension that that government had decided. So they'd made an allocation of funds out of their state budget to buy homes to put the homeless in. And that seemed to solve an element of the problem. But a twofold question, I suppose. That gets people off the street and puts them into a house, but does that necessarily solve the problem about social integration, about them finding a, an appropriate level of, of, of social satisfaction, integration in the community, et cetera, et cetera? I'd be interested just on the panel's views about that as one specific and concrete example. I know the Minister has said we've been hearing about longitudinal data and we've been gathering reports, and we have, and we've tried to make some suggestions about what we need to move on now. There was one from the US. Is that something that governments in this uh, country should contemplate? Uh, well, just very briefly, um, I don't want to drop our friends from Sacred Heart Mission in it, but it's the electorate I represent. and. They're now into the third or fourth iteration of their Journey to Social Inclusion report, uh, part with RMIT, longitudinal study, wrapping somebody up in not just somewhere to live, but all the services that they need, as against people that aren't. And what a surprise. The people who are wrapped up not just in somewhere to live, but in the services that are needed, uh, deal with precisely the issues dealt with in this report. And there are other examples of that. So it's not just a question of giving people houses. I've got a lot of public housing uh, in my electorate and in my community. Uh, the people who don't cope, who end up sleeping on the floor, who end up sleeping on the balcony, who end up back into the entrenched cycle of disadvantage are those just given a house. Uh, the, the physical space is of course necessary as part of the solution. You can't tackle homelessness without increasing the supply of adequate, uh, targeted and affordable housing, but we've learnt that it's not enough. Steve, can I make a couple of comments about that? First of all, in relation to the data, 
We don't need much, any more data about the problem. We solve it, we study the problem to death. But we do know, we do know good evidence about what works, and we often keep on repeating the old solutions that don't work, and I've seen that over 40 years and I'm a bit sick of it. So that's why I go on about that. And governments invest lots of money. Think about what's happened to government labour market programs so that, you know, that, that, you know, and we don't learn. We don't learn in terms of what works. So I do feel passionate about that. In relation to housing, um, it's interesting, we've just released a report a week ago on housing and employment where we looked at the administrative data from two state government public housing, um, Western Australia and South Australia, and also looked at centre link data, and we were able to um, uh, bust a myth that public housing is bad for people's employment. When we looked at the people who are in public housing and compared them with other people on social security, including people in rent, we found that the um, employment and when we um, controlled for the characteristics of the people in public housing, we found that they were no worse off. Public ha and indeed, we found that people's stability of employment generally improved in public housing. And we looked at people in private rent, and we found that people who have to move a lot quite frequently, often they suffer employment uh, in terms of employment. So there was a finding there about the importance of stability of housing for people's employment prospects. And it's quite an important, um, I think, uh, finding. And often um, public housing has been perhaps demonised un, you know, unfairly for in terms of um, uh, its impact on people's employment, where it's really the situation of the people. That's the issue there. OK. Look, I think this is probably a reasonable time then to open up the discussion to, to all you folks. Um, as I said, uh, the opportunity should not be lost. You've got a captive minister, literally. Uh, you've got some uh, very, very smart people on the panel up here. Not necessarily this side, but over there. And, and, and these folks can answer your, your questions. So, look, we have a couple of roving microphones uh, by, by dedicated CETA staff. Uh, I have certainly one down the front here, and then I have one... No, I have one over there, then I have one down the front. Thank you. If you just identify who you are, the organisation, and who you want to put the question to, question please. Uh, let's not get a debate going just yet. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kathy Humphrey from Sacred Heart Mission, and thank you, Minister, for... I was itching to jump up and mention our study, the Gender Social Inclusion. Uh, the 48 month report will be uh, launched next, next Thursday. Um, so, you know, as a sector, we are really interested in not only understanding the problem of entrenched disadvantage, but how to respond to it. Um, and certainly our report was a pilot demonstration to, to look at how we can resolve that problem for a particular cohort who are long-term and high homeless. And I just want to, I'd like to congratulate CEDA on the report. I think it's terrific to uh, get this issue out in the public domain and have it strongly debated and discussed. But importantly, um, if we can become solution focused, I think that's really important. Um, I think one of the things I, I think that I haven't heard yet today is the particular issues that I think that entrenched populations experience. And things, they're things like histories of trauma. One of our studies that we worked on found that the homeless population had experienced up to 21 episodes of trauma compared to four mm -hmm. episodes of trauma in the, the mainstream population. I think there's lots of psychosocial factors that keep people entrenched um, in addition to structural issues. They're often absent from the discussion. Um, the, the study that we found had people who had experienced homelessness before the age of 18 and then had spent 10 or more years trapped in cycles of homelessness. We had people who had experienced uh, sexual abuse, people who had experienced um, multiple traumas including a um, series of violences. So I think it, um, we need to sort of include how we respond to particular the trauma for the individuals as we help them move out of their, their disadvantaged state. So I just, I guess I'm offering that up as an opinion and a, um, a comment from the panel. Um, I think um, one of the things we looked at in the PC report on in disadvantage was the importance of life events, which are often, and, and trauma is one of those. So I think it's very important 
that you remind us of that. You know, it might be um, some people being uh, losing their job as a result of an accident or for or marital breakdown can be a significant life event for many people. Um, I think what, in terms of your project, what was quite important about it, which isn't often discussed in, re in addition to the structural factors, is the importance of relationships as a way of... Um, of um, people being able to find um, different ways of living their lives and uh, making connections with other people. And so I think that's so often neglected, the importance of relationships and ser the services that are um, dealing with people like this, being able to provide continuous, stable, um, very supportive, long-term relationships, uh, which are so often mi um, missing because we uh, fund our services on short-term basis and people don't often have that security of employment. So I think that's quite, you know, A, a benefit of your project and a continuing challenge in this area. Hi, everyone. Uh, Julian Pocock from Berry Street. Um, addressing entrenched disadvantage in Australia. Um, thinking about that, I was I'm reminded of three funerals post-World War II migrant from Italy, um, one for um, Al Bamblet, who was a very significant member of the Aboriginal community who grew up, uh, born one of 14 children on the riverbanks outside of Leeton, and a colleague from work's dad who died just recently, who was also a post-Second World War migrant. Um, and when I think about people I know who are over 60, who grew up in entrenched disadvantage, and what it is they wanted for their children and how they thought about addressing entrenched disadvantage, it was that their kids got a fantastic start in life and a great education. And I think there's something we can learn from families who have themselves thought about this question, how do we as a family deal with entrenched disadvantage? And so often it seems to be about educating their and where that took my mind, and this is coming to the question, is I think we think about particularly the early years service platform, but also primary and secondary school systems as universal platforms, but the truth is they are not universal platforms. And what we see through Berry Street is that there are so many young people who, for circumstances beyond their control, get to the point where school is finished and they have an access to education. And there's very little chance for them to go back and get what they missed out on. So my question to the panel is, as part of addressing this disadvantage, do we really need to re-examine re and confront the truth about some of these platforms we talk about as being universal, but which in reality don't actually reach the most disadvantaged children and young people um, that need to be reached? Who wants to go first? Steve, I might, I might start. Yeah, Julian, thank you so much for that. The, um, your experience at Berry Street resonates very much with the Smith families. Uh, we were a historically a welfare organisation doing emergency relief. And it was actually our families who said to us 20 years ago what they wanted from us was help with their children's education because they saw it as the pathway out. In terms of schools, there are, we know, lots of young people from the first year of school who are not doing well. So the gap doesn't just end when we see year 12 and the, and the difference between high SES and low SES. It actually starts from the first day at school. I think we do need um, to actually revolutionise some of our institutions, both from the early years but also through schools. Schools are and should be a universal platform. We should, I think, as a community, be demanding that there is investment in ways which actually narrow that gap so that schools are able to realise the potential. They are public institutions. I know there are many schools battling for a whole range of reasons because they have large numbers of highly disadvantaged children and young people and doing good work in difficult circumstances. I think some of what the Minister referred to in terms of cross-sectoral, cross-jurisdiction, corporates, government, not-for-profit sectors working together are the ways forward. I don't think we should say 
let's just park schools and not expect them to be able to realise the goal that they've set themselves. Um, I think we should hope to reform and work with schools so that they're able to and well resourced to. I think I um, absolutely agree with those comments and the critical uh, importance of education. Um, I, the only thing I'd add is when we did a PC report on the school schooling workforce in 2010, we said one of the other things that we needed to do was make sure quality teachers are in schools where there's lots of disadvantaged children and we don't do enough, enough of that. So I think that we could have a better debate about how we can achieve that. critical. Uh, as I said before, uh, we need to target those who are at higher risk and I think the schools play a, a key role in that because basically they have access to information. Right? They interact with children every day and they can tell you better than, better than no one who, who is more at risk or disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. To reflect on both of what Barry Street and Sacred Heart have said, and I use this example because she's real. Um, we'll call her Karen for the sake of the exercise. She's 19. When she started life, uh, by the time her family had dissolved around her, she had 13 child protection reports, eight investigations and six interventions by state authorities before she was six. She was in eight foster care placements uh, over that period of time. She had four kinship care placements. At 13, she entered residential care. In residential care, she was sexually assaulted. Uh, she had periodic emergency room presentations through the health system in that period of time. And unsurprisingly, her engagement with education was minimal. Uh, as a result, she had intense engagement with mental health programs. Her family that she then got back together with um, at uh, different levels was in, uh, resided in public uh, housing and she was in an area of public housing between the ages of four and nine by the time uh, her teenage years and she left the care system, she was homeless. Not surprisingly, she had multiple arrests for thefts, assaults and drug-related crimes. Again, not surprisingly, she was convicted by the Children's Court. She entered the youth justice system, was placed on a community order, came out of the community youth system uh, justice system and was immediately homeless. Through the intervention of various NGOs at that point, her life's slowly getting back onto an even keel. Karen's a real person uh, and in terms of the sort of stories that she reflects, that early universal platform, it doesn't guarantee you success, but it gives you a much better basis on which to try to engage early and deliver on all the sort of principles that the CEDA report talks about. Talks about. Uh, early intervention, coordinated linked up services and person-centred uh, responses. Sadly, I think the consensus of everyone on this table, and I think governments of all colours across the board, is that institutionally we're unable to deal with the Karens and it's the traumas and the lack of adequate uh, universal services that um, uh, she's evidence of. I have one question here and then I have one over here. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Mark Scott, from the Department of Health and Human Services. And possibly for you, Anne, the, the comment uh, that you made about $4.4 .4 billion worth of services being spent for disadvantaged cohorts or re engagement activities, and we don't really know if they're effective or not. Often we have situations where small, promising pilot programs are identified, they're evaluated, and they're positive. Um, they're never taken to scale. Part of the reason they're never taking the scale is you have to stop. Sometimes you can't always fund something and take the scale. Sometimes you have to stop doing something. Have you come across, you know, um, the, the biggest two here, have you come across good examples in Australia or nationally where governments and communities have actually made those really hard decisions and stopped something that might be a bit of a sacred cow in the, in the, in the public mind to start doing something that the evidence says you should do, not just new stuff, new money? I think others on the panel might also want to um, comment. I think the dollars I was talking about were not actually your portfolio dollars, they were actually education, so that we could have layered on some of those. Um, I, I do think we face a challenge of scale in Australia. I, I couldn't agree with you more, and I think many of the not-for-profits here would share 
the, the pilot syndrome that um, we've all faced, where you get a small amount of money to do a small program. It's terrific, it works, but that's the end of the pilot and it doesn't get scaled. Um, that's why, and others might want to talk about other initiatives, we've at the Smith family decided to invest significantly in the Learning for Life program. So we're doing it at scale, at the, at the larger scale we can at the moment, it's 34,000 students. Most of that funding, it, it's currently $30 million, all bar 600,000 is raised from non-government sources. Um, what we're tracking and we're holding ourselves accountable to this is improving school attendance rates, improving year 12 completion rates and improving post-school engagement in employment, education and training. Um, we also have large, a few pilots going around as well, but for us, we've taken a step back. We've stopped in our own organisation, the Thousand Flowers Blooming, and said, let's really focus on something at particular scale and make sure we're delivering as we can. But I'm sure others will comment about other, other good initiatives. PC is usually pretty good at telling government what not to fund, but I can't think of anything right off the top of my head now. Um, but um, I would say that the minister's given, given us the example of the NDIS, and I think that's a really nice example about how you bring something to scale, but do it in such a way that um, you trial it and you learn as you're trialling. Uh, and that was what we rec the PC did recommend, the way that we should introduce it. And it may be that we can bring more things to scale in that way. And that's, you know, that's open, transparent sharing of licences and modifying as you go. And hopefully we will be able to do that with the NDIS as it unfolds. Glad you didn't identify any um, programs to cut. Uh, <laughs> cheered me up no end. Um, but the truth is that if you're going to measure these things... There has to be some relatively agreed and relatively objective evidence-based measure. Uh, and there are jurisdictions around the world in comparable uh, systems that do that and how they book those savings identified to reinvestment and changes of investment in the here and now. And um, you don't have to look too far for those. Uh, there needs to perhaps be a wider community discussion, a sector discussion, about what some of those measures need to be. Thank you. Over here. Thank you. Uh, the Young Lady Department of Health and Human Services, thank you for the report. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts on implementation. Um, I've heard um, a number of people speak about Commonwealth and state governments, um, and that's natural because there are levers at both levels, but local government, I think, is a very important player at a place based level, and we see the Um, uh, thanks, Fiona. Um, if you look at place-based um, solutions, then local government as the most linked into community uh, level of government is important. And to use the NDIS as an example, uh, in Victoria, home and community care is largely delivered by local government, not exclusively, and it's particular focus in Victoria is long rooted in uh, bygone times and it delivers valuable services that keep 1.2 million Victorians in their homes and in their communities at different levels. Um, and the NDIS is meant to reflect that and overwhelmingly local government is signing up to that. Uh, but there's starting to be cracks in the system and we're starting to see some areas of local government use the opportunity of the NDIS uh, to position to exit that support. And that doesn't speak to me about the all of government, all of community um, delivery of those linked up services. Uh, now that's not just to have a whack at 
a couple, and I stress it's only a couple of local government areas, but what it is to say is that we still don't have, even in an area that is being built up to scale like the NDIS, enough of a community or political consensus as to how to tackle these issues. And if we can't deliver it in all of local government, then um, it's going to be a little bit hard to deliver it in partnership with the rest of the community. And the other, the other dimension, slipping back into my former life, is of course that the federal government fundamentally raises most of the revenue and then distributes it down the line. And uh, a, a number of local government areas, of course, put up very well-meaning programs and federal government say that's terrific for a pilot. And then when the pilot runs off, they flick the funding responsibility to local government who therefore have to make some consequential decisions about what they're going to continue to support. It's a never-ending issue around perhaps that might be tackled, as I've said earlier in my comments, more broadly, not just dumbing it down or defining it down to the issue about welfare, but fundamentally looking at it from a, a broader perspective as to what it means, say, uh, the, the Federation white paper process that's going on at the moment. What does that mean in terms of stopping, shifting responsibility to different levels of government when we should have a broader approach? Here ended the lesson from me. I have one final question over here. Thank you. Oh, the only uh, we haven't apart, um, the only thing I would say about that is that our report does show that um, social housing can play a role in um, helping people have stable housing that'll help them to get employment. But I think uh, so. You know that's really quite an important finding. I think. So you're right that there is a growing demand and need for, we're gonna wrap people up in services that, serve, that address not just uh, the opportunities for employment, but to deal with the entrenched disadvantage that's uh, identified here. The anchor to that is somewhere to live. Uh, and the reality is that post the GFC stimulus, there's been not a lot of capital. Uh, and if people, as they would have, have seen the white paper on housing and federation, um, the federation debates, if they had seen the uh, so far mysteriously invisible um, NDIS uh, housing paper, if they had seen the now released uh, mental health uh, paper, there's not a lot of capital from the Commonwealth. And we're essentially seeing the ending of the post-war consensus as to what the role of the Commonwealth in delivering state-based housing services are. So I think inevitably the pressure is going to come on states such as ours to use our balance sheet, the assets that we bring, which don't meet the current needs, in a much more creative way and in a different way that's going to be able to uh, lever off those balance sheets and partner, particularly with the community not-for-profit sector, to reinvent those assets in a way that delivers more social housing, but without flogging them off in such a way so as to just pay the increasing maintenance bill on a smaller and smaller number of them. There's the magic. If anyone's got a solution, I'd be uh, happy to share my business card with you.
Thank you, Minister, and thank you, panellists. To, to propose uh, the formal vote of thanks, could I invite um, Pam Muth from Asel Allens Consulting, our sponsors for today, to propose that vote of thanks and to present uh, a very small token of our appreciation to our panellists. Thank you, Pam. Thank you.